that sense, I, I think that, uh, that that case, from which all the other reapportionment cases followed, is perhaps the most important case that we've had since I've been on the court. Shortly after his retirement from the Supreme Court, former Chief Justice Earl Warren remarked on what he considered the most consequential case of his tenure. This was the guy who presided over Brown v. Board of Education and Miranda v. Arizona, among other landmark cases. So, a lesser-known 1962 redistricting case called Baker v. Carr was a surprising answer. In Baker v. Carr, Chief Justice Warren joined the majority in ruling that federal courts could force Tennessee lawmakers to refresh political maps that had not been updated for six decades, concentrating power in mostly rural, white communities. It was the first step in a series of cases in the 1960s establishing that every American deserves equal representation in government. But in the years since, a new form of political disenfranchisement has taken hold, one the courts have been less willing to challenge. Gerrymandering is a historical problem that the United States has had almost as long as we have been a republic. We are the only Western democracy that allows legislators to draw their own lines. You win the elections, you get the power, and redistricting helps determine who wins those elections. As states across the country gear up for the once-a-decade process of redistricting following the release of new census data, it's time to ask, how did we get here? Did the founders really intend to design a system where politicians choose their voters? What, if any, laws, regulations, or rules are the people designing our political maps bound by? And can anything be done to make democracy more democratic? Redistricting. Now comes a new battle in Utah. It's the topic of redistricting. The redistricting process will shape Texas politics for the next 10 years. Every time we conduct a decennial census, one of the things that follows is adjusting political boundaries so that we have about the same number of people in the same types of districts. This is Justin Levitt. He is a constitutional law professor at Loyola Law School and runs a website called, appropriately enough, All About Redistricting. Levitt says that when building their new democracy, the framers thought deeply about how they could ensure each citizen in the sprawling new nation would have roughly the same amount of political power, with one appalling exception. Equal representation is a really important fundamental constitutional principle. Enter the census. You know, that form you fill out every 10 years that asks about your age, race, and family. The census exists in part because the framers needed a way to count population changes over time so that states could add new representatives to the areas that had grown in size. When you have one person representing hundreds of thousands of people and one person representing a couple thousand people, the population gets pretty upset at that disparity. Some people are overrepresented, some people are underrepresented. They don't have enough voice in the legislature communicating their wishes for policy. Ultimately, the framers left states, and thus the politicians who run those states, in charge of refreshing new political boundaries. Almost immediately, those politicians figured out they could manipulate the process for political gain. Many people associate redistricting with a gerrymander, and many people associate gerrymandering with the early 19th century, 1814, map drawn by Elbridge Gerry. People perceived that this one district was drawn purely for political advantage. Another way of gaining a political advantage? Do nothing. This was the approach the Tennessee legislature took when it refused to update its map for 60 years, ultimately leading to the Baker v. Card decision. This 1959 photo shows the mayor of Nashville humorously pointing out that as a result of the stale maps, rural counties with more pigs than people had greater representation than big urban centers. It was a little bit of naivete and a little bit of blind spot for the founders not to have anticipated the legislative instinct to preserve their own self-interest and their partisan self-interest when deciding on representations. Until Baker v. Carr, federal courts largely refused to intervene, unwilling to get involved in what one justice called the political thicket. But the one-person, one-vote cases that arose out of the civil rights movement finally required states to ensure all citizens have equal representation. Problem solved? Not exactly. After Baker v. Carr, doing nothing was no longer an option. But the politicians in charge of redistricting still had one powerful tool at their disposal. So if you have the state house, the state senate, and the governor all controlled by the same political party, then in most states, that party will be able to parlay those legislative and executive advantages into drawing 
congressional and state legislative districts that will advantage their party. Over the years, both parties have practiced the dark art of gerrymandering. Democrats have molded maps to their favor in states like Maryland and Illinois. But after racking up governing trifectas in states across the country in the 2010 elections, Republicans used their power to take gerrymandering to the next level. Partisan bias, largely from gerrymandering, currently gives the Republican Party a net benefit of 16 or 17 seats in the U.S. House of Representatives. What we're trying to make sure happens is that we get to a system where we draw lines on the, that doesn't favor one party over the other, and most fundamentally, doesn't allow politicians to pick their voters. Eric Holder served as President Obama's attorney general. He has reteamed with his former boss to try to end extreme partisan redistricting. That's why I supported former Attorney General Eric Holder in starting the National Democratic Redistricting Committee. Holder says all Americans, no matter their party, should care about how and why politicians are grouping them together. I mean, gerrymandering is, is, a, is a prime reason why we are so polarized as a nation. When you have these safe seats, uh, a person who's in one of those safe seats is more concerned about a primary election than a general election, which means that that person caters to the extremes in, in their party. So how is this even legal? While laws vary by state, map makers only have a few restraints. Generally, you want maps to respect county and city boundaries wherever possible. And you also have to be mindful of protecting the voting rights of racial and ethnic minorities. And thanks to one person, one vote, there's that whole equal representation mandate. The one thing that seems to be fine and totally legal, at least for now, crafting maps purely to give your party an unfair advantage. The US Supreme Court has said that partisan gerrymandering claims can't be adjudicated in federal courts, but there's still the possibility that state political parties could sue against redistricting maps in state court. So what's the solution? A growing number of states have opted to give their map-making powers to nonpartisan or independent redistricting commissions. You have an opportunity to serve on the Independent Citizens Redistricting Commission and redraw our election maps to ensure they're fair. The use of these, these commissions, and you're taking politicians, interested politicians, out of the equation and letting di a disinterested body, these nonpartisan commissions, draw the lines, that's the way to finally uh, eradicate the gerrymandering problem. Of course, not everyone agrees. Former Wisconsin Governor Scott Walker, who chairs a Republican redistricting group, thinks politicians should ultimately be left in charge of the process. There's a lot of folks out there, unelected bureaucrats, these commissions they create, which are clearly partisan, uh, where you put power in the hands of people who aren't elected. Whatever the solution, polling shows that both a majority of Democrats and a majority of Republicans dislike partisan gerrymandering. But until states, or Congress, change how we do redistricting, politicians will continue to rig the game in their favor. What is at stake is our democracy. If we're gonna unravel this problem, we've gotta pull on the cord of gerrymandering, uh, get that out of the system. And I think a lot of the positive things that, uh, that we all want in our system will then begin to flow.